Are you going to know them by their prophecy? Are you going to know them by their words? Are you going to know them by their fruit? Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Every good tree bears good fruit. Every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Our parents used to tell us that growing up. We just didn't know how to inspect the fruit. They could see what we couldn't see. And we say, no, they good. They good. That's my friend. They said, they ain't no good for you, baby. Father said, a father should bury his son. A, a son should bury his father. A father should never bury his son. They ain't no good for you, baby. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders in your name? These ain't just preachers. I mean, these are the all-stars, prophesying, casting out demons, doing many wonders. The thing about this, and I'm, I'm going to run with it, is that uh, Jesus was always surrounded by people who said, show me a sign. They wanted him to do many wonders for him. So, so the fact that Jesus is warning that there are those out there doing the things you are requesting, but they are not real. Tells you that you have the potential to be deceived because you're going in looking for something. The enemy is a salesman. He sells you the product that you want. The Lord is a father. He gives you the thing that you need. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You may be seated. We're in this series, Trans. It's week three. I think I might finish up the sermon I started three weeks ago today. So this is just part three of that. <laughs> if it's your first time in here and you say, man, what is this series, Trans? We have been talking about, for the last couple of weeks, we've talked about the trans Christian or the trans pastor. Um, those who identify as, as a believer but don't have the proper equipment to, to match how they identify themselves. How they want to identify themselves by, by their words but not by what God has equipped them to be. Uh, it's, it's those who say they believe in God but live life as though he doesn't exist. They say, I'm, I'm a Christian. Jesus said he walked up to the fig tree to get some fruit, and it was nothing but leaves. It looked like a tree that could bear fruit, but it had no fruit. It looked like it could feed the hungry, but it could not feed the hungry. It had some of the perks of a tree, which is it could provide you shade in a hot time. But if you stay there long enough, you'll starve to death uh, because it presented itself as though it had something that it did not have, and thus it was under a curse, and it dried up. This scripture comes in, and it talks about uh, immediately it jumps off into the, what I would dub as the trans prophet. It says, beware of, of, of false prophets. They present themselves uh, like sheep, but out, inside they are ravenous wolves. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, so it, it says that basically these prophets are not real, and the thing that they wear upon themselves or show you is not who they are on the inside. The problem with having something different on the inside than what you can identify is the Bible says that it's what's on the inside that matters. The Bible says that how a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The Bible says that God, when he, he sent Samuel to anoint David, said, I don't look on a man's appearance, but what's going on on the inside. Jesus said it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of him. Because out of the overflow of the, of, of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's going on on the inside is different from what's going on, on the outside because they're trans. Come on now. Come on. Come on. Good. He says these trans prophets, uh, they associate differently. This is, this is how you know a trans prophet. Come on. Come on. 
is, here's the thing, because today, I'm, let me tell you why I'm sick of COVID. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why I'm mad, son. Because our stuff is more John Blaze than that. Y'all right. don't know, y'all don't know hip hop, that's all right. That's a shout out to Aaron, because he's been typing that on our comments for the last three weeks. Here's, here's the thing, is um, this time of, of, of COVID has turned into what I believe a lot of people are calling a prophetic release that I have not experienced. And I'm pretty in tune at, at times of what God, I believe there is revival in the air. I believe that there is a, a, a great awakening beginning to hit this nation because people are being pushed to prayer. I believe that's as simple as when you bombard people with fear, they run to the one who can protect them. See, the enemy makes a mistake when he thinks that his intimidation is going to keep you in chains. Oftentimes, his intimidation is going to push you to the feet of the one who can protect you. And so what happens is all things end up working together for the good of those who love God called according to his purpose. What the enemy meant for bad, God turns around for good. And so there are a lot more people praying now than ever, but also there's a lot more people periscoping than ever. A lot more prayer calls than ever. A lot more FaceTimes and, and lives and, and all that you do. <laughs> uh, you ain't, you, folks that ain't served in a church and ever going live every day. I seen three churches planted. I ain't going to say their name because I know them and they know me. <laughs> and we got a lot of mutual friends. <laughs> a lot of churches planted in this time because somewhere you, you believed because you went live every day for two hours and had seven fans on there that you was pastoring something. Went and got a brand and a logo and incorporated and started passing the, the digital offering plate. Ain't been sent by nobody. Listen, it's funny, but it's true. This is true. I, I, that's, I can't say the name because y'all going to go Google and look them up. And they look silly. Right? <laughs> so, so, so you see all of this. And, and, and the, the thing about the, the media today is it gives you the ability to be in rebellion without looking like rebellion. Which we should not be surprised because false prophets come to you like sheep, but they're wolves. So, so they look like something they're not. So it's, it's not no surprise that rebellion dresses up like it's order. Okay? So, so the, way, the way it is now is you ain't never kept the nursery, but you on live every day praying for everybody. You can't pray for me. You can't pray for me. Your, your, your marriage a mess. Your bills is six months past due. You thought COVID was an excuse to not pay your rent. Now you want to cover me? How about you cover the cost? So, so, so now everybody, everybody, I see everybody's prophet and prophetess this and prophet that and this and that. And I got a word from the Lord and everybody's prophesying over the election and everyone's prophesying over this. And I'm sitting back watching a lot of cats fall on their face right now. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? How do, you know, how do you know the difference between a real prophet and a, real, and a trans prophet? Um, does the prophet have the blessing of the shepherd? Because it's obvious that he's in the flock. If he wasn't in the flock, his sheep's costume wouldn't deceive a sheep when a false prophet comes up which means the real prophets are also in the flock, right? They're among the flock. And, 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 and there's a language. There's a language that comes from the prophetic that is able to be mirrored. This is the thing about, about church. How many of y'all been in church sometime? Yeah. Listen, I was a church um, back, back home. Let me just say that. And the pastor has a distinct draw on his preach. Okay, a distinct pronunciation, the mind of God. And the Lord saith, right, and, and I'm like, okay, okay, sound good when he does this thing, you know. <laughs> and he, had a, he has a, 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 a look, 
His hair is cut a certain way. He's got a patch, had a patch, God rest his soul. He had a patch, like a gray hair, right there. And it wasn't dyed, it came out right there, like that. And uh, everyone in the church, the pastors, the elders, and the members, all got a patch. They talk like this until they pray, and then they pray, and then God came into the room. And it's like, come on, bro. Like, we was just talking. You going to bless dinner like that? <laughs> We're just saying grace. What are you doing? But, they, <laughs> but there is a language, and what happens, if you don't know the spiritual language, you identify with the sound you hear, right? If, if you don't have an ear to hear what the Lord is saying, to tap into what the man of God has tapped into, you tap into the fleshly existence and try to replicate it. So while the prophet moves among the flock, the wolves can dress like sheep, mimic the language, and trick the sheep. Is he submitted to the shepherd? Is he operating in the authority of the shepherd? Because the Bible says that the anointing is subject to the prophet. If the authority of the shepherd is absent, then the hunger of the wolf is present. If the authority of the shepherd is absent, then the hunger of the wolf is present. Because there is no peer-to-peer prophet. This is going to hurt a lot of y'all feelings. There is a prophetic anointing that everyone can operate in. Yes, there is, there is the gift uh, of, of prophecy that comes from the Holy Spirit. It is the gift of prophecy that we should all seek. But when it comes to releasing prophecy in a corporate atmosphere, it is submitted to the fivefold ministry. It is part, prophecy is part of the fivefold, not part of the sheepfold. You have to be leery when you have a onefold prophet. Everybody want to catch you in the parking lot. Shoot you a text message. Everybody want to want 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 to want to want to tell you I, I had this dream about you. No, don't. Why don't you dream about you? Because <laughs> you know we can all see your life. We can we can see no roots. We can see you 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 claim these great gifts, and year after year you are in the same location, in the same place, in the same pattern. Have not have not climbed that ladder that you said God was bringing you up on. If you can't get your stuff right, how are you gonna get mine right? Jesus, Jesus confronts this idea with these false prophets, but watch this, the, the rebuke does not go to the prophet. He didn't rebuke the prophet. He rebuked the people. He says, he says, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? He said, what is your problem? He said, he said, beware of false prophets. This is how they present themselves. Then he goes on to say, you can't get anything healthy from them. Are you going to continue to go somewhere else to get something that's not there? Uh, some of y'all keep ending up wounded because, because you keep feeding from the thorn bush. You, you keep ending up wounded and keep ending up bleeding because you're feeding from the thorn bush. That prick in your spirit should be uh, heated within your spirit before you go ahead and prick your life some more. Keep ending up hurt by a word, hurt by a direction, hurt by this. And I thought God said, I thought God said, no, that sounds like the howling of a wolf. Jesus says, every good tree. Somebody say every. every. He says, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. You know that if a bad tree bears bad fruit, ain't no good fruit on a bad tree. There is no good fruit on a bad tree. Somebody needs to hear that so they can get their boyfriend off their couch. There is no good fruit in a bad tree. Yeah, he means everybody but you. Ain't no good fruit on a bad tree. Everybody's here, but, but you see something different. You get a different him. No, ain't no good fruit on a bad tree. She going to be faithful to you this time. No, brother, ain't no good fruit on a bad tree. Somebody in here who used to cheat, who faithful now, who mad at me. It's all right. When you got faithful, you moved out of the city. Don't nobody know your history. Just, just, just smile and amen it. 
You should, you should laugh because if you're scowling, we know you're unfaithful. <laughs> it, doesn't say, it doesn't say on some good trees. It don't say some good trees bear good fruit. It says every good tree bears good fruit, which gives me the ability then to really, really evaluate you. Because you can't say, oh, it ain't fruit season. That tree couldn't look at Jesus and say it's not fig season. Couldn't say, come back tomorrow, I'll have some figs. Trust me, my figs are the best figs. I know you came right now, I just ran out. But tomorrow, we're going to have fig newtons and far fig newtons. That's not how it works, because you should have Good fruit. Um, it don't say some. This is why it is a faithful saying when Scripture says that you should judge a tree by its fruit. This is why when, the people who yell don't judge me are the fruitless people. They are the ones that, that are full of leaves, but you can't put no fruit out their life. And they say, well, only God can judge me. Well, listen, when Jesus does it, you dry up. You should allow me to, to, to help you out before he get here. Because if I can't find a fig, my God. There's no exception. Every good tree bears good fruit. Um, So if I know that and I get to judge you by your fruit, here's what I say to folks. Let me see your resume. I need to see your resume. Uh, Don't touch me. Don't lay hands on me. Don't blow in my direction talking about here come a new wind. Don't prophesy over me. Don't speak over my life. Let me see your resume. But the Lord said, resume. Resume, please. Because there's a trail of bodies behind you. And I don't need to be in that trail. Resume. The reason I need your resume is the next thing Jesus says is that a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. I need to see it because a bad tree, he says, um, cannot bear bad Good fruit. I love this because this challenges me. Because I be messing up. Anybody ever messed up just other than me? Anybody ever messed up big? Anybody ever messed up big when you was in the best, most holy time of your life? (laughs) Anybody never messed up? All right, cool, cool. I got me one. I got me one. (laughs) Never messed up. This is, this is the thing. The Bible says this about a righteous man. I talked about this some months ago, but that a righteous man falls seven times but gets up seven times, right? That you can't even tell if a man is righteous until he falls. The qualification for his righteousness is his ability to get up. If you have never fallen, I don't know if you're righteous. You might be a wolf. You might be in sheep's clothing. I need, I need to see how you hit the ground. Once people trip over you and step on you and don't help you back up, let's see if you're going to lay there too long till you die or if you're going to get up. That's how we judge your righteousness. It's not how you stand, but how you get up after you fall. So, so, so if a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, then that tells me if a righteous man falls, falling ain't bad fruit. Um. Because a good man in a dark valley is not without the Lord. David said, for thou art with me. People will look at you when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death and count you out. They'll look at you when you're walking through that time and say, you can't make it back. Look, I told you he wasn't going to be on top forever. I told you she wasn't going to get that dream done. I told you that, that they were failures or that, that you should look out for how their past caught up with their future. No, no, no. Thou art with me. I'm not down here by myself just because you can't see down in the valley. Um, we write folks off when they error. Uh, but their resume confirms that they're a good tree. Yeah, you messed up, but I can look at all the good you've done. And it's not just good in your heart you've done. You have actually done good. What is in your heart has manifested in your life, not just in your personal life. It ain't just in your own home or in your own car and, and look at your own business. It's that everything that you touch is blessed. Everything that every person that's in your life is benefited because you are in their life. Uh, no, there's a resume, so your error does not stop you from being good. Um, but if you got consistent bad crops and you want me to believe that this time is going to be different, no, 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 no. Some of y'all.
You're going you're gonna to quit your job and start that business because these guys promised to invest. But they don't have any reputable business that they have ever invested in. So you're going to end up on unemployment. Um, you, you met him when he had a girlfriend. You met her when she had a, a boyfriend. You met him when he had a boyfriend. <laughs> But it's going to be different this time. Jesus says, <laughs> Jesus says, he says, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. He didn't say I knew you early and you walked away. He said I never knew you. The crazy thing is when he says this, he, it, it, right before this, this is their argument. I prophesied in your name, wolf. I cast out demons in your name, wolf. It says they did many wonders, wolf. It says I never knew you. When you look up that word knew, one of the understandings of that word in the Greek is it's an old Jewish idiom. That means marital intimacy, yes, yes, yes. sexual intercourse. Adam saw Eve and, and, and then he knew her. Some of y'all know something y'all ain't supposed to know right now. <laughs> he, he, he said, I never knew you. Um, that there is a way that the groom knows the bridegroom, or the bride knows the bridegroom. There's a way that the husband knows the wife. We are the bride of Christ. There is an intimacy that is supposed to happen between the church or the bride of Christ and Christ. There is something that is supposed to, to reproduce out of intimacy. There is a closeness. There is, there is, there is all of that. Um, we talked last week, I think we ended on this, is that the clarity of identity is reproduction. One of the things when people say, I identify as this, I identify as a Christian, let me see your fruit then. Because you judge a tree by its fruit. I identify as, as, as this thing. The clarity of identification is reproduction. If you cannot reproduce, you are not who you say you are. And I can identify you by what you reproduce, not by what you tell me you know. Uh, it's understood that you teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. And so I don't listen to what's coming out your mouth. I look at what's coming out of your path because what you're saying and what you're doing are two different things. That's why you can tell your children to do all the right things. And when they are older, they look just like you. Their marriage looks like your marriage. Their divorce looks like your divorce. Their bank book looks like your bank book. If you broke, they broke. If you are drunk, they are drunk. This is, this is, we call it generational curses, and we see it move through familiar spirits. But what happens is that familiar spirits allows you to train them up, not teach them up. So you say one thing, but they're watching and modeling behavior because training comes from observation and doing, not from classrooms. So what comes out your mouth and what comes out your life are two different things. Your children hear you say behave and they watch you misbehave. They hear you say mind your manners and watch you cuss out your husband or your wife or the waiter or the clerk. Whatever. And, and so when they get to school and cuss out their teacher and you say, I, ta I taught you to have manners. No, you trained me to act a fool. Because the clarity of identity is in reproduction, right? Um, God says, let us make man in our image. We, we can look at God and then look at what he reproduces and then know exactly who he is. He is God because he is the creator God. There is nothing that was made that was not made without him. Everything that was made was made through him and for him. He is a God who reproduces and makes us in his image and it says to us, go be fruitful and multiply. Have dominion. We can look at the instruction he gave us, go and subdue it. All of this is, is reproduced after God who has dominion, who subdues, who multiplies multiply so it's fruitful so we're supposed to go out and be fruitful and multiply and once we're fruitful and multiply look Jesus said I don't know you because you're known by your fruit 
There's no intimacy. There's no depth, depth of knowledge of who he is or, or vice versa because we can look at your fruit and tell you never spent a moment with him. He says that you're known by your fruit. You're known by your reproduction. You're not known by your words. You're not known by your claims. You're not known by your dreams. You're not known by your attendance. Um, you're, you're, these folks, they was in the flock. I mean, this is that great day. They're all before Jesus. They're in the flock. Jesus is not talking to sinners. He's talking to the church. Put your hand on your chest. Say, he's talking to me. He said, they said, Lord, Lord. The Bible said you can't call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So he is not talking to the world. He is talking to the church. So it's not about their attendance because they were in the flock. They were in the assembly. They called Jesus Lord. So these are those who know me. He said, he said you're known by your fruit, and I don't know you. The Bible says this. This is how you know a real Christian from a trans Christian. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. You're known by your fruit. If you're in the Spirit, you have fruit of the Spirit, right? So Jesus is not looking at your confession to him. He's looking at the fruit of the Spirit. Did you have love? Some of y'all so hateful. Don't like nobody. Some of you defend your dislike for people with psychological terms. I'm introvert. No, you don't like people. You're rude. <laughs> you are rude. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm type A, I'm a red lion. <laughs> no, you are loud rude. <laughs> you are on everyone's nerves, you are obnoxious. Love. Bible says, how can you love God who you don't see? But hate your brother who you see every day. Says you are a liar. You know, Jesus tells us that the world would know, that all the world would know who you are, that you are my disciples by the love you show one for another. This is what he says. Now, now peep this out, because, because I'm all about loving everybody. I love everybody, except that one dude. I love everybody, though. I mean, I'm, I'm here for, I got all the love. But... He ain't talking about that. He's not talking about that. Um, that's that's kind, of, kind of understood, but understand who he's talking to. He's talking to his disciples when he has this conversation. Because he says, they will all know that you are my disciples. So he's not talking to everybody. He's talking to his disciples. He says, they'll know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. So he's talking to them about them. He didn't say they'll know you're my disciples by how you love all the world. Or did he? Here, let me read it to you. Let me read it to you. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He's talking to the disciples about how they'll be identified as disciples. Here's the equipment, how you love one another. That's how you're going to be identified. You know we treat each other the worst in the whole world. The church treats the church the worst. 
The church, the church thinks they can bypass loving the church because, because they can say, well, Jesus hung out with sinners too. Hey, we all hang out with sinners. If you hung out with me, you hung out with one. I'm just going to tell you straight out. But the reality of it is we treat each other. I hate the church. I love God, hate the church. We, we get mad at folk in the church because they don't say hi to us. We don't get mad at people in Walmart because they don't say hi to us. Just at the church. We, we, we get mad at folks at church if they take our seat. We don't get mad at people at Cinemark 24 if they're in the seat we want to when we get there. Only in the church. We get mad at folks if, if they don't include us, if they didn't make us part of their group, if they didn't do this. You only been here three weeks. I'm 39 years old, about to be 40. You've been here three weeks. You want my most intimate secrets? You call it a click because I'm entitled to friendship like you? That if I have someone that's close to me that is proven faithful and trustworthy, that's a click, but you're entitled to a best friend? All you say when you say click is you wish you knew my business. You are, you are jealous that you don't know someone else's intimate business. Because you can get all the jokes everyone else can get. You can walk up on the circle that everyone else can walk up on to. But see, it's, it's when we start serving together that you disappear. It's, it's in those moments that I share what I learned some years ago. It's in those moments that we catch coffee afterwards and I say, let me tell you what my mother told me when I was young. See, you want that table without wanting that service. You want that secret without wanting that friendship. You want the details without the loyalty. You are a problem. Them. We treat each other the worst. We act like we are entitled to everyone's business so that we can go and prophesy to somebody about it. Well, I knew that already. The Lord had told me that you was out there sleeping around. Did the Lord tell you that? <laughs> the Lord ain't tell you about your own family? <laughs> Lord can't tell you how to keep your own kids from climbing out the bedroom window? They be lying, boy. Talk about every house. Um, what are we talking about? Um, <laughs> we treat each other the worst in the church. Don't invite each other to the stuff that's special. Turn down invitations because we don't feel like dealing with them. Right? Uh, do everything else for everybody else. But the world's going to know that you are my disciple, Jesus said, by the love you show for one another. I tell my kids... You practice how you play. Any coach tells their people that. I go a little further with my kids. I say, don't let me catch you treating a stranger better than you treat your brother or sister. Y'all might fight all day long in this house, but when we go over here, if somebody say something to your sister, even if you agree with it, you better be elbow deep in their mouth. I'll apologize to their parents for you later. Don't let me get home and find out somebody talked about your sister or your brother in the room and you didn't have something to say about it. Don't let me find out that you joined sides and started picking on them to make you closer to them. They going to go home and y'all got to grow up together. How you treat the people you live with worse than the people you don't. How you treat the people you worship with worse than people you don't even know their name. Those who give to the same cause as you, build the same vision as you, serve in the same house as you, pray for the same prayers, cover your family, fast for you, pray for your pastor who gives you a word, pray for your children's pastor who covers your children, and you treat them worse than total strangers in the world. Treat people at work better, and then people at work would just as soon step on you to take your promotion. Somebody ask you for help in the church, no, I ain't called to do that. Well, what is you called to do? Because you don't do nothing. I, I ain't called to do that. <laughs> what? All right. I love this. I love this because I tell my kids, let me find out. This is your, this right here, this is all that matters. And, and when it comes to this, you can say, yeah, but I ain't close to everybody like that. Right? But the Bible says that Jesus' mother and brothers came to him said so he was out of his mind. They had to get him out of the, work, out of the house from preaching the word. And he, they said, Jesus, your mother and your brothers. I said, he said, who is my mother and who is my brothers? 
That's a question we got to ask when, when we start knowing how the world's going to identify us by how we love one another. And who is my mother and who is my brothers? Those who are like-minded with me in the faith, Jesus said, which means look around the room. These are your brothers and sisters. These who are, listen, this is going to be controversial, but it's all right. Because it's biblical, because Jesus said, unless you hate them and love me, you ain't worthy of the kingdom. Right? So, 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 so here's the thing, is, is those who are like-minded with you in the faith deserve more loyalty, love, prayer, and faithfulness from you than your family who don't love God. Your family who would just as soon mock you for going to church often, mock you for giving to the kingdom, mock you for serving and giving your talents, those who would call you brainwashed or in a cult, your family who would just as soon have, hand you a drink or hand you a blunt or ask you to stay home with them and not worship the Lord or give you a psychologist number when you really need deliverance, those who would keep you bound up. Yeah, listen, I, I know it's hard, especially when you talk to, to, to black folks and Spanish folks, because we black like, family is everything, right? But, but, but here's the thing. Jesus said, who is my brother and who is my mother's? Those who are like-minded with me in the faith, don't sell me this idea that the kingdom of God is secondhand. This is my family. This is why we have race problems right now in America. It's because people worship their skin color more than they worship their God. That they are black or they are white before they are Christian. We forget that this is the family of God. That we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are sons of God. That we are heirs and co-heirs with Jesus. It, it, I don't even understand the idea that someone who does not honor the God that has bought me back deserves more honor than one who honors that God. We try to find ways out of it. But who is my mother? Who is your brothers and sisters? Look around the room. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, but who is my neighbor? Jesus said, I got you. <laughs> he said, it ain't that one. It ain't this one that you think is dressed nice that's doing this. It's this one that you would have no dealings with. That does not know you. That, that, that you go and help one, you have no clue who they are, and you pay the extra debt. Go and do likewise. We always try to find a way out of what God has commanded. We always try to find a loophole. What small print is unseen by the big God? At what point did you in your few years become uh, wiser and be able to outwit the infinite God? Well, who is my neighbor? <laughs> got you, God. No, dummy. You got you. <laughs> Love. That's one of the fruit. You'll know him by the fruit. Joy. It says joy is the fruit, right? Yeah. I'm going to blaze through this. Um, the, this is not just happiness. We talked about this before, but this is the joy of the Lord. I don't need uh, 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 the spirit of the Lord to have the joy of the earth. I need the spirit of the Lord to have the joy of the Lord. I don't need God to give me the things I can accomplish on my own. I need God to give me the things I can never accomplish without him. So this joy of, is of the Lord, uh, and the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is my strength, right? So that tells me that this joy is identified by strength, not smiles. That God's joy is identified by strength, not smiles. So you can put your face on all you want and walk through happy and all blessed and highly favored. I'm good, good, good. That's not how you qualify joy. You qualify joy by a person's strength. Clowns are identified by smiles. Joy is identified by strength. The joy of the Lord. Is in, is in our spirit and is by his spirit. See, too many want physical joy. Too many want to be physically joyful. That's why you keep ending up in that back seat. That's why you spend money on a gym membership you never use. That's why you keep ending up in that liquor store. Because too many people want to be, have joy physically. But we don't understand that the spirit is willing. But that flesh... That flesh is weak. That's weak. You ain't going to have strength in the flesh. And, and in the weakness of the flesh, the Bible tells us that the flesh wars against the spirit, and the spirit wars against the flesh. See, we have to allow, um, we have to allow what's in us or be able to push that joy that is in us out to manifest itself around us. 
That's that, that joy that God has placed in our spirit, we have to allow it to manifest all around us. The Bible says how a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That thing that's in you has to come out of you. Uh, I understand scripture tells me that in my weakness that the strength of the Lord is perfected. That, that, that while my flesh is weak, there is something stronger on the inside of me that is becoming perfect. And the weaker my flesh is does not affect my joy because the stronger my God is as he manifests himself. Therefore, when I am weak, then I am strong, scripture says. When, when you think uh, that is your strength carrying you, you're weak. When you think your strength is good enough to carry you, you're weak. You know discouragement comes when your strength fails. When you thought you had it and then you fall. When you thought you was almost there and then didn't make it. When you thought you had enough determination to push yourself through and then gave up because it, it just got too hard. Discouragement comes when your strength fell. But we understand that God's strength never fails. Right? Scripture says, for the joy that was set before me, before him. He endured the cross, that, that, that God put joy there before him, and it helped his endurance. Endurance comes from the joy that is set in your spirit. COVID can't take that joy. A lot of people right now is pandemic weary, COVID weary, tired of it. But when you got the joy of the Lord, COVID can't take that, right? Sickness can't take it. Elections can't take it. Unemployment can't take it. Abandonment can't take it. Folks can walk out of your life and they can, they can walk out with all your, your house, your car, but not your joy. Your kids can't take it. They can stress you out, but they can't wear you down. Uh, your, your finances can't take it. You might go broke in the bank, but you ain't going to go bankrupt in the spirit because the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Bible says that the enemy is seeking those that he may devour. He can devour those who are weak. Those who are yielded to the flesh, those, those who are weak. But you understand that he didn't even start to try Jesus. Cats will try you, won't they? You know when they don't try you? When you first come out the gym. Ain't nobody trying you then. <laughs> you could be chubby, but you worked out tricep that day. And you got that one little knot right there. And you walk around like, you walk around like the whole world can see what you sore about, right? Ain't nobody trying you because your swag is different when you come out the gym. That's that I lay you down. I'm already warmed up. Who want it? Here for all this smoke. <laughs> they won't try you when you when you ready. They try you when you ain't looking for it. They try you when you when they, when you're tired. The devil didn't even try Jesus. Until he was already fasting 40 days and 40 nights. They didn't even offer him food until he was hungry. And he offered him to turn rocks to bread, not to get water from the rock. Because on the fast Jesus went on, he could have drinks. He just couldn't eat food. So he tested him in the area of his weakness. Somebody say joy. Joy. Should be in your fruit. Uh, you know him by your fruit. Somebody say peace. You know them by your fruit. You know calmness and peace are not the same thing. This is not calmness when it says that the fruit of the Spirit is peace. It is not calmness. It is the peace of God. My peace in him protects my joy. A lot of people lose their joy because they ain't got no peace. My peace protects my joy. Scripture says that it guards my heart and my mind. That it guards me. So that thing that's on the inside of me is protected when the peace of God guards my heart and mind. Scripture says that it passes all understanding. You know that your peace should confuse the people around you. Your peace should confuse people who know you. Um, it should confuse the worrier. If you and the worrier agree, you and God disagree. Let that sit in your spirit. If you and the worrier agree about a thing, you and God disagree about it. You have decided to side on the part of the one who don't trust God. But your peace should confuse the worrier. It should confuse the realist. Your peace should confuse the logical thinker. Your peace should confuse the, an the analyst. Um, your peace passes understanding if it's the peace of God. If people understand your peace, it's not God's peace. 
If they say, oh, it makes sense that you be calm right now, that's not the peace of God. Because the peace of God passes their understanding. It's, it's, did, did you hear what the doctor said? How, what do you mean you're okay? The doctor said these are the three options for medication. What do you mean you're just going to trust the Lord? And this is not advice for you to bypass a diagnosis, but whatever decision you make, make it in the peace of God. And when you do, don't let people talk you up out of your peace. Uh, uh, you let that, that thing pass understanding. I don't, I don't understand how you lost your job today and you just cool. I don't understand how they walked out on you and you're okay. I don't understand. I don't understand these things. Good. That means God is with me. Because I had you with me the whole time. Look how I ended up right here. <laughs> Long suffering. This is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Long suffering. Uh, that's a, a big term for patience. Look at your neighbor say, chill. chill. <laughs> Look at your other neighbor say, chill. chill. <laughs> y'all thought I was going to have something cute to say right there, didn't y'all? Uh, <laughs> you know, if you can't wait, you will mishandle the call of God. If you can't wait, if you don't know how to wait, you will mishandle the call of God. This is, this is the error of half teaching. We all celebrate the suddenlies of God. And suddenly God did this. God is a suddenly God. <laughs> right, right. Now, God, now. Do it now, God. Move, move, move. God is a suddenly God. And, 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 and the thing is, that is true. But it's not true all by itself. It's not true in every circumstance because God's will is true in every circumstance. And God never said, I'm a suddenly God. God's reputation has said he moves suddenly. So we take his reputation or our observation and act as if he commanded that thing. God does not move suddenly in everything. Yes, I said it for all of y'all who preach indifferent. Show me what God said, I'm um, suddenly. Good, it ain't in there. I have looked from front to back. And it is not in there. Um, God's suddenly moments often come in moments of waiting. And this is the part that is not taught to you. Is that God does move suddenly, but often in moments of waiting. Uh, this is why scripture says, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. This is why God's instruction was stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You know, before the, the salvation of the Lord came suddenly, they were in war. They were praying and fasting and seeking a word and then still had to mount up for the war to stand there to see God move. Jesus told the disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait until you are endued with power from on high. Scripture records it like this, when? Somebody say when. Because if you don't wait, you're going to mess up the plan of God. It says when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Not when they were ready for it, not when they demanded it, not when they, when they went to the altar, not when they heard some, some name it and claim it or declare a thing. Over. No, no, no. When the day had fully come because you cannot rush God. It says, when it had fully come, they were all with one accord in the place. Watch this. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. The suddenly happened after the waiting. The suddenly happened after, after the day had fully come. Once God had done all that he wanted to do and the time had fully come, he moved all of a sudden. Too many of us want God to move all of a sudden at our wish. God is not our henchman. God is not our sugar daddy. He is our father. You cannot say, God, if I give you this intimacy, you're going to buy me that car. No, that's a hose relationship. Yeah, I said it. We, we, we ain't in the book of Hosea no more. God ain't married no prostitute no more. God came for a bride without a spot or a wrinkle. God came for one that, that he could wash in the water of the word and make radiant unto himself. He ain't tricking on you. Somebody said it ain't tricking if you got it. <laughs> scripture, says, scripture says we prophesy in part because we know in part. Um, 
the problem, because we prophesy in part, we forget that we only know in part, that there's a big part we don't know. So if we don't wait, we're going to move ahead of God. And we'll move ahead of God because we want to go from green pastures and still waters and paths of righteousness to tables that are prepared before us. We all want to bypass walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We forsake the valleys for shortcuts. What we don't realize is that if we, uh, if we move out of the valley, we move away from his rod and his staff. And his rod and his staff bring comfort to us. Some of y'all are probably uncomfortable because you tried to bypass the process of God. brings discomfort when you try to rush God into a result. Somebody say patience. patience. Somebody say wait on it. Yeah. Uh, you know by your fruit, uh, kindness. Well, you know, meanest folks is church folks. The most sarcastic folks is church folks. The most patronizing folks is church folks. <laughs> oh, the, 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 rude, the laziest husbands is church husbands. The, the, the rudest wives is church wives. That husband to go serve all day at that church, get home and not help you do the dishes. She'll pour coffee for the whole church, but won't get you a glass of water at dinner. <laughs> Hold on, the way, the way they're going to know you, my disciples, and love you, show for one another. <laughs> what you mean you can do it for there, but you can't do it for here? Get your house in order. Don't you pour that pastor no water and you ain't get your husband no water? <laughs> but y'all can give me water if I be thirsty, though. <laughs> I mean, this is all true. I'm not saying don't bring me water. I'm literally saying go get them water also. I need water sometimes. <laughs> don't undo the good part. Fix the bad part. You know, don't be like, well, if, if we're going to screw everybody, screw everybody there. No, bless everybody. Bless everybody. <laughs> get some of this water real quick. <laughs> Bless the Lord. Kindness. Some, some folks' faces are so mean that if they just took their mask off, they're scared the hell out of COVID. They'll make COVID leave. That's how mean they face is up under that mask. You know, kindness, kindness is um, kindness is lost where selfishness is found. Kindness is lost where selfishness is found. This is where, where, where people transition from being kind. Because kindness is not niceness. Kindness is kindness. Kindness is not politics. Kindness is kindness. Kindness is not you telling me what you think I want to hear. Kindness is kindness. Kindness is a heart issue. And kindness is lost where selfishness is found. The Bible tells a story of the rich young ruler. And, and Jesus basically says, if you want the kingdom, you go sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me. Listen, when his stuff hit the crossroad of helping other people, he walked away from Jesus. He walked away. He was no longer following Jesus when it required him to give up his stuff and help other people. Kindness disappears when selfishness uh, becomes present. Kindness is displayed in a you first mentality. Kindness is lost in a me-first mentality. Think of, and I've said this before, I'm sure, but in your marriage, how different it would be if your mentality was you first. In your job, how different it would be if your mentality was you first. Um, you wouldn't try to go home early if it wasn't about you first, but about the boss first. You wouldn't stay only if you got paid if it was about the boss first. Because that's kindness. I ain't saying don't get your money. I'm saying kindness. When it's all about the money, you stop, your attitude changes. Uh, when, when it comes down to what we gonna eat for dinner, you and your wife wouldn't argue about what y'all gonna eat because it wouldn't be like, I want this and I want this. It'd be like, you first, whatever you want. Then you might not really ever eat because <laughs> women do not know where they wanna eat. <laughs> but at least you won't argue while you're hungry. 
<laughs> Scripture says this. It says, uh, Philippians 2, 2 the 4 says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out uh, not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. If you treat people with a you-first mentality, but the only way to do that is through the Spirit of God. Because it's the Spirit of God who came to seek and save that which was love, it, that which was lost. It's your own spirit who wants to seek and save yourself. Yeah. The Spirit of God will come in and say, listen, sacrifice for this. Sacrifice. Give up the sacrifice of praise. Present yourself a living sacrifice. It's the Spirit of God that tells you it's not about you. Right. Let me get Manny up here because I'm about to wrap. In about five minutes, bring Manny up here. About five minutes. Real quick. <laughs> You're known by your fruit. Somebody say goodness. Yeah. See, the trans Christian has none of this. The trans Christian has niceness instead of kindness. The trans, the, the, the trans Christian knows when to hold their tongue but not be patient. Right? Uh, the trans Christ, Christian knows how to politic with you, not love you. The trans Christ, Christian knows how to hold their tongue in your presence but not have peace. There's, there's a difference. You have to watch because people get caught up and think that their behavior is actually what's going on on the inside. I can train my behavior, but I got to submit my heart. There's a difference. Goodness is a fruit of the spirit. Uh, be good don't mean behave. This is what we teach our children. You drop your kids off somebody's house, you say, be good. You don't really mean be good. You mean go and do good. You mean go in there and do the right stuff. Don't make me whoop you, right? But you don't necessarily mean be good. You just mean behave. Don't embarrass me. You know the rules we have at the house. Go follow the rules is what you're saying. But being good is not following the rules. Being good is being good. God is good. All the time. That tells me that if I'm made in his image, at what point do I get to take off from being good? Being good to people. Being a good person, being a good friend, that surely his goodness and his mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That his goodness, everything God created, he said it is good. He didn't say it does good. All things work together for good, but while they're working, they don't feel good because goodness is not attached to just your action, it's attached to your heart. Go be good to people. Sometimes it's good for you for me to tell you no. See, somebody can't accept that because all they know how to say is yes. You're a yes man. That's why you're tired. You say yes to everything. That's why you're worn out. That's why you can't keep good friendships because you say yes to so many people. Then you turn around and let them down. Then they call you a liar when you was just trying to do right by them. Sometimes it's good to say no. Faithfulness. Somebody say faithfulness. 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 Can you be trusted? This is a fruit of the spirit. Yo, 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 sometimes in this, let me know you by your fruit. Is sometimes your word? It is today. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Can you be trusted? The Bible says many men have undying love, but a faithful man who can find. You know, I don't need you to love me. I need you to show up. Your love, your love don't help me lift nothing. Your love, your love don't help me move furniture. Your love don't help me set up a light. Your love don't help, you know what I mean? Like, like, like your love ain't even felt if you don't show up. Loving God and being faithful to God um, and faithful to what he has said are both required. The Bible says that love and faithfulness secure the throne. Your feelings do not outweigh your action. Don't tell me God knows your heart when we can all see your hand and we judge a, fruit, a, a tree by its fruit. God knows my heart. Your feelings don't outweigh your actions. That's why faith without works is dead. You can feel a way. If you don't do it, God's not going to say, oh, it's okay. I knew you. He's going to say, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. You can't lose your faithfulness yet. Yeah, come on, Manny. Come on. I'm losing them out here. I'm losing them out. They all sleep right now. It was good in the first 15 minutes. Then, then the, they blood then rushed onto their feet or something. I don't know what happened. <laughs> you, 
you, you know, you can't lose your faithfulness uh, when the results aren't your preference. People lose faithfulness when they don't like the results they see. When you've been working at building that business and then the, 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 the finish line keeps getting further and further back, people get less and less faithful. When, 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 when you had an idea before you got married uh, that, that uh, it was going to be all butterflies and rainbows, picket fence and chihuahuas, that she was going to cook, that had that dinner ready for you every time you came home and be ready to feed you and minister to you. And that he was going to come home and bring the bacon home and, and cut the grass and massage your feet and light some candles and put some, some Teddy Pendergrass on. And, and Barry White, and turn out the lights and all that. Light some candles, but no, it's the same dirty laundry that he won't wash, that she won't wash, laying on top of the bed that y'all trying to be intimate on. And she say, hold on a minute, and she say, hold on a minute, depart from me, I don't know you. <laughs> it ain't happening in here. And, we, and, and so you lose faithfulness, because the picture that you saw ain't the picture that you got. People lose faithfulness when the results are not their preferences. Here's the thing about the result of a thing and why you should stay faithful to it if God called you to it, no matter the result. The results belong to God, not you. The results don't belong to you. If you are looking for a particular end for something that God called you to, you are not the qualifier. Your job is stay faithful. His job is the harvest. Your faithfulness belongs to him, not to the job. It belongs to him. That's why Bible, the Bible says do everything as unto the Lord and not unto man. You're doing it for him, not for you. Do you love your wife as unto the Lord? Do you honor your husband and love your husband as unto the Lord? Do you wash your car as unto the Lord? Do you work your job as unto the Lord? Do you raise your children as unto the Lord as if you are a steward? Do you manage your budget as unto the Lord? Because the Lord said the tithe is holy. Right? Do, do, you, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you wash your face as unto the Lord? Do you put deodorant on as unto the Lord? Listen, listen. I'm just going to hit it right here because, because the Bible says do everything as unto the Lord. How come you came here musty? Groom yourself as unto the Lord. Do your laundry as unto the Lord. Sweep your floor as unto the Lord. Get that dog hair out the food as unto the Lord. Get that cat off the kitchen counter as unto the Lord. Quit letting that dog lick you in your mouth as unto the Lord. That's nasty. Now I got to come here to the church and you going to kiss me on the cheek with dog spit in your mouth? Do it as unto the Lord. And it's funny, but this is true. Cut your grass, it's unto the Lord. Wash your feet, it's unto the Lord. Maybe you can't go buy no new shoes right now, but get an old toothbrush and scrub them old ones as unto the Lord. Do some push-ups as unto the Lord. Don't be trying to flex on me, Sheldon. Put it down. Some of us got to work harder than others. Eat your vegetables as unto the Lord. Don't eat unhealthy and then need and need some medical science miracle because you didn't eat yourself into a cancer or into, into a foot being chopped off. You, you, you do know you do know that prevention is better than prescription. You do know that God can touch a thing and keep you from ever walking down a road. We want God to fix it when we've done all that we want. No, do it as unto the Lord. Bless others as unto the Lord. Give as unto the Lord. Because when you give, it is unto the Lord. Watch this. Watch this. How, how simple that stuff matters. And the other story, if you look in Luke, it's the same story that Jesus is telling. He says, depart from me, I never knew you. And they said, I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in him. Blah, 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 blah. And he says, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. When I was sick, you didn't come. Pr and they said, well, when didn't we do this for you? He said, when you didn't do it for the least of my brothers... You didn't do it for me. Do it as unto the Lord. Gentleness. 
gentleness. You know your hard hand can crush somebody. Your hard hand can crush somebody. How many of y'all have a baby? Had a baby? Used to be a baby. That's everybody. That's what makes everyone's included in the example here. When you feed a baby, you don't force feed a baby. You get the milk in the bottle if you're not breastfeeding. You take it out the, out the fridge. You put it in the microwave or you put it in the boiling water. You get it warm. You don't take it out the microwave and out the boiling pot and put it in the baby's mouth, scold and hot. You don't. You sprinkle a little on your wrist, see if it's too hot. You put it in your mouth, you, you blow it, you get it cooled down. You make sure that it's just right for the baby to be able to accept what it is you're feeding them. You feed the baby gently. When they get to solid foods, you take those vegetables, you mash them up. You know, you, you warm it up and it, you taste it a little bit. You, I mean, you, you make sure that when it gets to the baby, it is not harsh and that it is not something that will choke him or harm him. Your, your hard hand will crush something. You can crush your marriage with your hard hand. You can crush your children with your hard hand. And that's not just a dad's strictness, but dad, you can crush your sons or your daughter. The Bible says do not provoke your children to anger because you can crush your children with your hard hand. But it's not just dad's strictness because easy is not gentle. Gentleness and easiness are not the same thing. So mom letting them slide with everything a, a, a hard head make for a soft behind later. You let them slide on everything and, and the police gonna teach them later. You let them sli slide on everything and they gonna teach them in the hallways or on the corners later. Somebody gonna teach them somewhere if you don't. That's why if you spare the rod, you hate your child because you must hate them if you gonna let somebody else who don't love them beat on them because you won't correct them. I'm going to whoop my kids because I love them. And I know that that love is going to bring restriction to make sure it's for their best. But if I don't do it, somebody who has no love for them ain't going to know when to stop hitting them. You can crush your next idea with your hard hand. You know, by, by their fruit, self-control. I'm not going to teach on self-control because we've been kind of hitting this one for the last couple of weeks, but we know the scripture that a man who has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Self-control. I can tell. Jesus can tell. You ain't got no self-control. Everything sets you off. They bring you your eggs with no cheese like you ordered at the restaurant. And you pick up that plate and you frisbee it back into the kitchen <laughs> everything sets you off somebody stepped on your shoes if someone stepping on your shoes sets you off like that you can't afford the shoes and it's not them who made you mad it's you who stressed you out you spent money you did not have on something you could not afford and cannot replace once it's broken so you have to idolize those things and protect them from all enemies foreign and domestic you have a constitutional covenant with your with the item that you purchased everything sets you off we say things like you made me mad no you made you mad because you don't have no self-control nobody can make you anything but y'all get it Jesus says this He's identifying the real Christians from the trans Christians because understand that everyone who's standing before him is saying, we belong here with you. We identify as yours. Lord, Lord. They come to him saying, Lord, Lord. So now he's separating the real from the fake. And he starts out, and, and before he gets to the story, letting them know that you have to watch out for false prophets because those that you follow are going to end you up in one of these two positions. Your leadership is going to bring you here to where you thought you were qualified to stand here. He says, I never knew you. And then he goes from that conversation, he goes, if you read on down past that, I never knew you, you worker of iniquity or you practices of lawlessness. He goes on to say, for if you hear a word and don't do it. I liken you to a, uh, to a foolish man who built upon a sin. If you hear a word and do it, I liken you to a wise man. So he gets into talking about this, that there is a production, that when you hear the word, that you begin to reproduce, and you are identified by what you do with what you hear, that this is how you begin to know uh, 
how he begins to know you because you, I know you by your fruit. You're known by if you do the will of the Father. He says, if you love me, in Scripture, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Because if you hear a word and do it, that's how I know you. I know you if you keep the will of God. Scripture says that uh, Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciple. This is how they know you're my disciple, the love that you have one for another. You're doing the word. I'm watching your fruit. All of this plays together for the real believer. The ones that he did not know, he says, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. The crazy thing is the works that they were parading were not lawless works. It was prophecy, wonders, um, casting out demons. They were, they were lauding all of the works of the kingdom, all of the works of the ministry, all of these things. And he says, you are a worker of lawlessness. That word practice, those who practice lawlessness, it means this. It means to do or to work out or to work for or to earn by working. It means to acquire, to trade, or to make gains by trading, to do business. Those of you who do business with lawlessness, those of you who make a trade, is working for a wage. This is why it's explained to us that the wages of sin is death. Jesus is telling them, I don't know you, because while you say all of this, you have made an exchange. You have been working a labor for lawlessness. It does not mean that you just have to be dealing in murder or that you have to deal with adultery or just fornication or sorcery. If you read Romans 1, it deals with that they invented ways of doing evil, that they disobeyed their parents, that they were gossips, that they were slanderers. I mean, that, that, that you begin to work iniquity so the fruit of their labor was something different. The lawlessness, when he says you worker or practicer of lawlessness, in the Greek it means illegality. It means uh, a violation of law or to transgress the law. This is a hard word for those who have been taught that God's going to love me no matter what. That God's going to love me no matter what. Here's the thing. God will love you no matter what. But he will not bring you in no matter what. He will love you no matter what. But he does not have to give you reward no matter what. The reward doesn't go to all. The reward goes to those who believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. The believers get the reward. The Bible says that a prophet doesn't lose his reward. There, there is, there is a, a, a reward that comes with certain actions, but whoever taught us that just loving God entitled us to every reward, entitled us to every benefit, entitled us to every closeness, entitled us to the kingdom, entitled us to the, the will of God, has lied to us. The reality of it is we can exchange the work of the kingdom for the work of lawlessness, that we can decide that this wage is what we want versus this this gift that God gives we can decide that it's okay to do a little prophecy and do a little of this too because grace 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 Jesus says not everyone who says to me Lord Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my father in heaven trans Christians do not do the will of God they do their own will and they call it the will of God. It benefits me to prophesy to you when you're going to admire me for it. It benefits me to counsel you when you're going to pay me for it. When it's going to get a bigger offering. It benefits me to do wonders around you when you're going to celebrate me and be loyal to me because of it. But it don't do nothing for Jesus. If all of those works only bring you to men, if all of those things only bring you to people, only bring you to dead ends, and, and someone can satisfy your spiritual fix by pretending to be like a prophet. Father God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, God, because you have given us the example of what your children are, of how 
believers are supposed to be on how you would know us on how we would know you on your desire to know us to be intimate with us God to speak to us to search us out for us to search you out God that you have shown us all the warnings to avoid father that that you have made us without excuse your words as we thank you that you have given us an abundance of evidence an abundance of your presence God an abundance of your speaking and your word and confirmation that you have given us your very spirit to dwell within us and lead us and guide us and speak what is heard from you we say thank you we ask you God that if we have ever identified but have not matched our identity that is in you that you would transform us father your word declares that we shouldn't be conformed but be transformed let there be a spirit of transformation that happens God that what is on the inside begins to shift to what you created us for before time father I declare right now in the name of Jesus a shifting within somebody's heart God I declare right now in the name of Jesus father a shifting in somebody's mind in this moment God that that you will begin to Build within them that which you have created before time. Your word declares that you have knit us together in the secret place, that you have saw our unformed bodies. Your word declares that you know every day before any day comes to be. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, in this place, we yield to that. And we say, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. When you came in, you received... An envelope, that envelope says tithe and offering. There are three ways that you can give here at Square Root. One is in that envelope. Then there's uh, through text um, or through our app or online giving. And then there is Cash App. All of that is there. We believe here that giving is an act of worship. Uh, we believe we can never outgive God. And being made in God's image that we are givers like he is a giver. So if we say that we are like him, we move like him. Bible tells us never to give a compulsion but what we have set in our heart to give so if you are unsure what to do in this moment it's not if you should give it's what you should give just sit quietly before the Holy Spirit right now and let God tell you understand this that the devil is never going to tell you to give to God so if you hear something in your in, in your spirit don't start arguing with it and binding the devil <laughs> the devil wants you to go to Applebee's after this with, with your offering money but God, God will speak to you on how to give. So we, we keep our covenant with our tithe, but our, our offering, that's something that God speaks to us. Father God, we thank you for the privilege to give to your kingdom. It's from you. So we give you this portion back, God. We ask that you, that you honor it, that you bless it, that you multiply it, that you work wonders with it. Father, I pray for every giver. Father, that it come back to them in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, that men would give into their bosom, that jobs would open up, that promotions would come, Father, that favor would fall upon them, that what they have in their home would stretch and meet every need, Father, that, that your provision would be abundantly clear. In Jesus' name, Father, I pray for those who have a heart to give, but they don't have the means to give. But if they had it, you would give it. They would give it, God, and you know their heart. I pray, Father, that you bless them the same, that you would provide them seed. Father, because your word says you provide seed for the sower and bread for the eater, that this week that they would go fed and next week that they would overflow. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>